All right. Good morning, everybody. This is, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is uh, week two of the Armchair Sports Universe recap. I'm joined with my co-host, Steel Backer. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to dive right into week two. Uh, the first segment that we're going to start off with is a State of the Union of uh, both of our uh, respective franchises. So, Steel, go on up. Well, another win. Another week, another win. It's always, it's always a good sign. Playing Patriots in a uh, AFC Championship uh, rematch. Um, and it was great. Uh, it was not as high scoring as like. We got some things to figure out on the offense. I kind of hoped after last week how we kind of finished that we'd be able to carry that momentum over. But uh, not quite the case. We got uh, some work to do there. But we got a pick six. And um, the defense, still um, one of the best in the league. And hopefully that continues to hold. Pass rush was awesome kept him under duress all game honestly hats off to drew lock for us to get a game as he had considering he had a guy in his lap every play um but yeah i think things are looking good here in pittsburgh how about you so we lost again so we're 0-2 uh we did have a little bit of um playoff hopes this year uh we didn't expect it but we thought that we could make it so an 0-2 start does put us a little behind the eight ball but we're playing what i think is the toughest division in any of the armchair sports universe so there was always a good chance that we're going to start 0-4 uh so the pressure is on us though for this week uh hopefully the uh, team responds to that pump up video <laughs> um the rangers uh just to cover other uh, franchises uh the rangers are on the cusp of making a pretty substantial trade uh will allow us to clear enough cap space to fill out the roster um and make a push for a second straight stanley cup so Pretty excited about that. It's a tough trade that we had to make, but all in all, pretty excited. Um, and the and the Mets, uh, close to uh, playoff contention, so we're feeling pretty good. Um, I guess I didn't mention my Cubbies. The Cubbies over seventy wins. You know, we'll we'll f- hopefully finish that seventy five range, and that'd be a pretty special season, much better than our in real life uh, counterparts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with that out of the way, it's, uh, sticking with baseball, uh, can these we have the St. Louis Cardinals? Excuse me. Um, they are nine and one in their last ten games. Uh, the Brewers at four and six is making that NL Central race really uh, heat up. So, being that you are in the NL Central, what are your thoughts on that division? I thought the division was wrapped up like a month ago. Like I like as I was trying to make a push to like kind of make these votes, I thought that I was going to catch the Cardinals more likely than the Cardinals are going to catch the Brewers. And it kind of looked like it was going to say about that. You know, the Cardinals stayed basically split me and the Brewers. Um, every time I make a push, it kind of just get repelled. But I was playing really well against the Cardinals, so it kind of helped me stay there. But then they just decided, what if we stopped losing baseball games? <laughs> and they're right there a half game back. Um, and I think they're – actually, they may be tied now because I think the Brewers just lost to the Mets. Last – the broadcast game, I'm pretty sure they lost. Yeah, they that, did. They, so I think that it's, it's tied. It should be evened up um, with 10 games or so to go. Um, so definitely much more exciting than I thought it was going to be, um, yeah. <laughs> at least in the Central. I will say that I didn't expect – like I thought that if one division race was going to heat up, it was going to be the NL East because it had just been kind of waffling back and forth between uh, tight and too close to call or – you know, close enough where you can just kind of feel comfortable. Um, the Braves seem to have taken control of that. But, uh, yeah, the Cardinals, I mean, that's I, – I, we should just be watching the Brewers and the Cardinals every day now because um, that race is uh, – I don't think any race is uh, as tight as that, is it? No, no division race is nearly as tight as that. I yeah. think every division is pretty much wrapped up or at least wrapped up to the point where, like, they're both going to be in the playoffs. But yeah. this division is the only one team that's going to represent Central um, unless just a collapse. <laughs> but, like, it's going to be the Central the winner as the only representative. So it's hot and it's tied. So, yeah, probably the best one. Yeah, so the Cardinals are five and a half back uh, in the second wild card. And with, like, what, two weeks left to play, unless the Mets pull off another historic collapse, yeah, it's just uh, – it's winner take all, really, in that series, which is – it's – the arguments we made is that like every day we should be having the the Cardinals and the Brewers uh, as one of our highlighted games. 
definitely. Um, speaking of the sticking with baseball here, speaking of tight races, we go to the AL Central. The Cleveland Guardians, uh, eight and two over their last ten. Mariners are seven and three, and the Blue Jays are three and seven. Uh, the Yankees are tied with the Guardians. Um, but the where, where's that race now? It's a two game lead. Yes. Yeah. The wild card. So both the Yankees and the Guardians have the wild card spots. Right. Um, same record. They are two games up on the Jays and the uh, Mariners. Yeah. Um, so then the, the Yankees have fallen to four and six in the last ten to kind of end up in that tie because it looked like the Yankees were going to be a kind of like lock for that top wild card spot, and it looked like you know the bottom three and that we're going to kind of fight it out. But the uh, Yankees have found themselves right in the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, and that's just going to be the race to watch in the AL because I don't think any of the divisions are necessarily up for grabs. I think the I think the Central could be, if I remember correctly. I'll have to look at the standings again. I should have looked. I should have been looking at that before I started talking about it. I think AL. The American League is fairly tight. The AL East is done. It's the Rays. The Rays have a seven-game lead over that, but the AL Central, you, like we're talking about now, the Guardians are two and a half behind the Tigers. But the Guardians are eight and two in their last ten, and the Tigers are four and six. So that division could very easily switch over the next week or two. And the AL West, the Mariners are two and a half back on the Astros. Uh, both teams are seven and three in their last ten. But so if one of, if the Astros all of a sudden go cold. You know, and they are—they're on a two-game losing streak based on the last time that we saw the uh, the standings update. Uh, I haven't checked the daily scores. They did just lose to Houston, and they so the the last two games they were one and one against Houston. So I mean, you know, if one of those teams goes, if the Astros go cold, we could end up seeing both of those division the leaders of those divisions uh, flip within the next week and a half. Yeah, I should have looked more past the wild card because yeah, it is. It's six teams competing for four spots. Yeah, because or yeah, six teams competing for four spots. I think or five teams. Yeah, in the mix of like the the, the division and the like, who yeah. wins the division and who wins the wild card and and yep. yeah, and the Blue Jays and, and Mariners are two back each on either on yeah on either wild card spot. So it's it's not even like one team has ran away with one of the wild card spots. We could. We could see the AL Central leader and the AL West division leader flip and both wild cards flip within the next week or two. Yeah, we could see almost the wire to wire um, AL Central and AL West leaders fall out of the playoffs entirely because they are only the half game up on the wild card. So if they lose their divisions, it's very likely they're going to lose the wild card along with it, um, just based off how the standings are shaken out. Now, this brings up an interesting question that i i just popped into my head what happens if we have a tie for the al west a tie for the al central and a tie for both wild card spots <laughs> we'll play we're playing a lot of game 163s <laughs> yeah a whole we bunch of play, we might be playing some game 164s <laughs> maybe 165 in there just to feel a little spicy yeah <laughs> but yeah i don't know how, i mean it's certainly possible it's within this close margin yeah, and it's just going to be really fun to watch those. Um, so stay tuned for those for, for baseball. Keep following our YouTube channel uh, for, for those races. But we're going to flip over now to uh, football, which is our pretty much our premier sport right now. And it's heating up now as we finish our week two slate of games. The Cowboys, uh, the production matching the roster finally, uh, as opposed to in real life. They are 2-0, and the top offense in the league by – 100 yards um they lead in passing yards and in rushing so the question here is how real are the cowboys are they a legitimate threat in the nfc well they they've played up to it they haven't had an easy slate of games and they did win them both by three points so they're, they're doing just enough um but yeah it's, they have a 100 yard lead on the offense just in two shootouts uh lead most points in game they are second in rushing the ravens do beat them which lamar is going to help you with that yeah. Um, but then the defense on the flip side has completely mirrored that again, makes sense being in two shootouts, but they are the bottom three defense overall. So, um, it'll stabilize a bit. I'd imagine, uh, I doubt they're going to have a hundred yard lead after this week in yards. Although they do play the giants could be a game that they go, but the defense is going to need to start not <laughs> allowing slightly less points on their offensive scoring. <laughs> 
Well, it's really interesting too because so they're two and zero. The Packers are two and zero. Those are the only two and zero teams in the NFC. The Buccaneers one and one. We'll get into them in just a little bit. The Bucks and the Packers face off against each other. There's a decent chance that the Cowboys could be the lone undefeated team in the NFC after this week. The Packers, after playing the Buccaneers, play New England, the Giants, and then the Jets. So a little bit of an easy slate. Their schedule does seem to get a little bit easier uh, over these next few weeks. Uh, the Buccaneers is pretty tough. You've got Green Bay, Kansas City. You know, easy one in it. Not an easy one in Atlanta, but an easier. Then on the road against Pittsburgh. Uh, so Tampa Bay might have a tough, uh, you know, tough road ahead. The Cowboys, there's an argument to be made that they could be the second best team, maybe even the first, the, the leader uh, in the NFC by the end of the season. I mean, we'll see how it goes, but they definitely have the roster to do it. And one thing that I always found interesting is we, a lot of times we criticize the Madden roster for making the Cowboys too good it's not a question of whether or not they're bad to me. Like the Cowboys have a good roster in real life. Usually they're just stunted by horrible head coaching or some, some really bad injury, which is, so I think that like, if you actually put them into Madden, the reason that they do well is because their roster, at least for the last few years has been really good. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, well, for the most part. And then like last year, what son of them was just Dak deciding to be awful. in some of these yeah. big games they had like, and they want to play the game too because he kind of figured his stuff out. But they lost to the Patriots because of that. Like they could have easily been, you know, pushing for like a two seed instead of a three or four seed. Yeah. Um, last year, so they're kind of right in that mix. Um, getting Tyron Smith back would be huge. Um, they, they haven't shown that they need it, but I think it does matter more than. Yeah, uh, especially for like just just the road ahead, just making a little, things a little bit easier, uh, especially on their running game. Um, getting Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, a little bit uh, even more production. I mean, maybe that bumps them up to first uh, in the rushing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they might need to make a, a slight adjustment to their defense, maybe a little bit of an improvement here and there. Nothing too crazy. Um, but, yeah, they're, I think they're a legitimate threat. I think they could easily be a contender for the NFC representative in the Super Bowl. Um, we'll move – I'm sorry, you have something to say? No, I definitely agree. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, we'll switch now to the uh, AFC. The AFC West right now has the Chiefs and the Broncos, surprisingly, at 2-0, and and the Chargers and the Raiders at 1-1. and uh, I don't know how you feel. The Broncos winning the first two games, to me, is up there with the biggest surprise uh, in, the, in the ACFL right now. I'm going to be sweating out that three wins prediction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could it could very easily uh, flip. I mean, the the first two games that they played were against Seattle and Houston. So I mean, you the Seattle one was a little bit of a shocker. The Houston one, not so much. We expected Houston to to be one of those teams in the mix for a top five pick, uh, or at least a top ten pick. So winning that game, not so much of a surprise, but. I mean, yeah, 2-0. and it's, You get a couple wins here and there, and all of a sudden, you know, you get you, you start looking at when Deshaun Watson's coming back, and you think, ah, maybe maybe playoffs are a real possibility for the Broncos. Yeah, they've got six games against good teams, at least teams that you would not expect to be top five picks coming up. Yeah. Like, Texans were kind of that easier one. <laughs> like, the Texans are still in that phase where they're trying to rebuild this thing. Um, but they've got the Niners, Raiders, Colts, Chargers, Jets, and Jaguars. Um, the, the Jets being the lesser of those record-wise right now. Yeah. Um, but teams that you can see being tough to beat um, in that spot. You know, they get the Raiders and Chargers on the road. Yeah. Um, so those are huge division games for them. Yeah. Um, on the flip side of that, the NFC West. Um, you've got the 49ers, the Rams, the Seahawks at one and one, and then just as surprising as the Broncos starting two and oh, you have the Arizona Cardinals at oh and two. And it's not really the fact that they're oh and two that is so concerning to me, it's the way that they are oh and two. I mean, you had mentioned it to me, their, their completion, their team completion percentage is like 46%, I think is what you said. 
Yeah. And we're going to, we'll touch on them more later because that's kind yeah. of our closing segment here. But yeah, definitely uh, the shock of the season. And it does not get easier for them. Uh, yeah. That'll again be something we talk about later, but their schedule is not going to get any easier in that division. Um, and playing the AFC West, it's a division that's really hot right now. Yeah. Uh, but I was, so the Seahawks kind of came out and surprised me last week. They had the Niners, a bit of a tough draw based on the team that I think is going to be really good. And they came out and played really well, and they won the game. Um, coming off that real stinker they laid week one to come out and beat the Niners 27-20, it's a good bounce back game for them, and they got some winnable games coming up. Uh, they can really get hot and get on a run. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is why I wasn't really worried about them after the first week. I mean, I, you don't freak out after week one losses. That's just a good rule of thumb to follow, especially in Madden where, like, things easily flip. Um, so yeah, I mean, coming out, it, it's, I think it's good. It'll, it might give them a little bit of a, of a morale boost, especially if anybody lost any morale from that week one loss. Um, so they don't risk at any, you know, residual effects from that, but yep. it's also just that the division is just going to be so tight. And so getting that win to, to even yourselves up with the Rams and the 49ers, that's it, just, it can't be understated how huge that is, uh, especially with the Cardinals dropping to 0-2. We thought all these teams were going to be in a dogfight for this division. It, it seems like, especially if the Cardinals uh, don't handle business this week, uh, mm-hmm. it seems like it's going to be a three-man race between these two teams. And the Cardinals play the Rams. I, like I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about them later, but just covering the NFC West right now. Cardinals play the Rams this week. That's not an easy victory, and, and it's another way to really kind of eliminate them um, or start eliminating them from the NFC West race. Yeah, well, the Panthers, they, they head to Carolina for week four, and that's an offense that's put up points. So yeah. they're going to be able to score in that game. And then the Eagles, the same way. The Eagles are like the third best offense in the league right now. Yeah. So I mean, they have yeah. some tests coming up, and then they're going to get the Seahawks. So I was going to kind of piggyback off my Seahawks point. Yeah. The Seahawks have three pretty winnable games. They can really sling the shot themselves up to a point where they're riding high, feeling good, and they can end the Cardinal season before they get DeAndre Hopkins back in week six. Yeah. Like they can put the car, the Seahawks, or the Cardinals can be one and five at that yeah. point because they have a tough schedule. They may steal one, and the Seahawks can be the team that ends it for them coming off of an easy stretch. So things are not lining up uh, very well for the Cardinals and could line up very well for the Seahawks trying to take a division for the yeah. second. Sh- they did, they lost last year at the end, didn't they? They did win a I playoff so. game. Yeah. But yeah, they're the wildcard team. So yeah, taking the division from the Cardinals who won it last year. Yeah. Um, we'll switch now to a little bit of a more uh, fun topic. We have pick six bonanza. We had two pick sixes in the Saints game. Uh, Tom Brady uncharacteristically throwing two in the same game. Uh, and then we had one by Ramsey and then another one by your boy, Leo Chanel. Yeah, uh, it was just fun. Uh, and they all happened in the broadcast games, which uh, I was expecting to see more after that, but there was zero in week one. So no defensive touchdowns at all. There were some safeties, which are fun. You know, everyone loves it. Wish there were some this week too. Uh, but uh, yeah, you got McDougal right away early, and then Jim Othi getting the pick six, uh, big signing, uh, bringing the fireworks for that game. And then, uh, yeah, Ramsey, I mean, crazy game. Uh, I don't, did I announce those yet, or have I been waiting to announce the? I'm pretty sure he won Defense Player of the Week. Like, it'd be pretty hard to, for him not to have won Defense Player of the Week. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you score a defensive touchdown, it's usually like a, it sticks in the mind of people enough that, like, yeah. Well, again, that's the thing. He he got the defensive touchdown, but he also got three of them. Like he yeah. picks. He was he was a lock to win it. Yeah. Um, I voted for Jim Othi just because he's a legend. But we can actually we can actually cover them right now, real quick. The uh, ACFL Offensive Player of the Week with 410 yards and five touchdowns was Dak Prescott. Uh, the Defensive Player of the Week with three interceptions, one being a pick six and a uh, deflection, is Jalen Ramsey. The Rookie of the Week. Uh, is my boy with seven catches and 126 yards, Drake London. So just to cover those now, just to. And the special team player of the week, I didn't nominate any others, but Carlson, five for five, 57 yarder, and two 50 yard kicks. I mean, he won him the game outright. Yeah. 15 nothing beat the Cardinals. So <laughs> uh, there was nobody really that close. There was a couple guys who had four field goals, but didn't have as many as long. Uh, Jack Fox gets an honorable mention for being a punter, making four field goals, but <laughs> that's, that's it. I mean, that was all that they really had. Yeah. Um, we'll switch now to the armchair basketball league as the season 
right on the cusp of really kicking off. So we'll preview some of the, the two of the, the heavy favorites now to uh, win the NBA, the ACBL title. Uh, re, could we get a repeat of the previous uh, finals with the Portland Trailblazers and the Milwaukee Bucks, or do you see one of them slipping off? I think it'd be pretty hard for them to repeat. Like both teams to be back where they were. I felt like the Bucks, especially last year, were pretty weak throughout the year, and they turned it on at the end. Um, they would have to pull a similar sort of thing to kind of get back to that point. Um, and the Blazers kind of ran it wire to wire, but it's very tough to run it wire to wire once, let alone twice, um, given all the moves that have happened around the league. Um, so I'd be pretty shocked if it was a acorn versus steel part two in the ACBL, um, just because there's so many good teams. It's, it'd be very hard to, um, but we can dig into it a little bit. Um, yeah. I'll, go, I'll go first with mine. So sure. I made some moves. Um, you have to. You can't stay still. Yeah. Um, my starting five is going to be the same coming into next year. I uh, just brought everybody back there. But uh, I decided to go a little more guard heavy on my, uh, my depth here. I made a you know, trade Gordon Hayward. I got um, Malik Monk. Not Malik Monk, sorry. Monte Morris. I replaced Malik Monk with Monte Morris. Seth Curry for a little bit more shooting. And then Will Barton to kind of be that 3D uh, wing type. So we're going guard heavy this year. Yeah. Um, so I, personally, I think that like you did, you have a better chance of making it back to where you did. I mean, I just think that like top to bottom, your team is stacked with heavy hitters, but you also have a, a pretty solid bench. Um, the Bucks are, are the team that I'm a little bit concerned about. I, I don't think they have a strong uh, bench at all uh, for the most part, especially compared with, with some of these other teams. Uh, I mean, they were a six seed last year they were 46 and 36 and I, I don't think they really had like a bad injury for that would it like kind of excuse that low of a record for them um but ultimately i i i would agree i don't think that the bucks are going to get back there the only major addition that i really could remember uh is them trading for derrick rose which might give them some scoring but uh we might have an issue with uh derrick rose hogging the uh the, the scoring attempts as well which might uh upset some people in Milwaukee and, and kind of taint the chemistry that they've had over there. Yeah. Well, and they also, they traded Jay Crowder for him and Crowder fit a pretty good yeah. role for them. A role I don't know if they really have right now, which is just like, the, he started three, I think for them. Like, I don't know exactly what their uh, plan is for that. Um, I liked them going out and getting Noel. Um, that was a pretty, I like that. Noel's a good fit um, for that kind of role next to Giannis, but I don't know. Is that was that last year or last year? Yeah, this year, I think. Yeah, yeah I think it was this year. Yeah, this year. Sorry, I, straight on since got kind of weird. Yeah, um, just it's hard to search for stuff in this one. The other one I can search it pretty easy, it feels like. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's just it is what it is. Um, the nets aren't going to be as high, you know, I said not having KD and they're probably not going to have Harden by the time things all shake out. Yeah, um, because I can't imagine playing for this team. <laughs> um, the Celtics made a big move that got Brogdon just like they did in real life. Um, so the Celtics are going to be even more formidable, I'd say, than they were last year. And uh, they were a team that just kind of let me down. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you're going to have the Hornets not there. And the Hornets were a team that killed everybody's dreams, it felt like. So, except for the Bucks, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think that's the only thing that really helps the Bucks is that the Nets are going to slide out of there. Uh, I don't know about the Heat. I think that the Heat could could fall a little bit, um, unless I'm just missing a trade that they made. Uh, I don't really think any of the uh, teams on the bottom of the East really rose up at all. Um, so, I mean, they could slide up and, and they could find their way out of the East just because it's, it's probably going to be just the Hawks, the Celtics, and the Pistons to contend with. I think the Pistons are still maybe a year away from really being a contender with, with their roster. Um, they could surprise some people, but for the most part, I, I think they're a year away. So I think that's just really the Bucks just have to hope that that prediction holds true and nobody really rises up. And maybe you even get a little bit more of a drop off from teams like the Hawks and maybe even the Celtics. Like maybe just Brogdon, for whatever reason, in the sim just doesn't fit well with the team. I don't see that happening, but I think that's kind of what you're hoping for through the Bucks. Yeah, we'll have some interesting uh predictions and stuff to go through in the next like coming weeks as we talk yeah. about it gearing up for the season but for the Bucks, specifically i think they've got a good chance to be a top four seed yeah um, just because of Giannis. like i think they're going to kind of coast and they'll finish maybe a little higher than they did last year last year was kind of weird for them to be the sixth seed 
Um, I see them stepping up to be you know, my home court for at least a series. Yeah. Um, but it's just a matter of, is that going to be, are they going to be enough? Um, yeah. And if there's a big move in the works, um, I've, I've heard them be in on some talks for some big moves, but um, either they didn't win them or the moves just never really happened. So we'll see if, you know, Acorn's got something brewing that can change the team around. Yeah. I, I yeah. If you were to ask me between the Trailblazers and the Bucks, which team has the best chance of getting back to the finals and even repeating, it's going to be the Trailblazers. Like I, I head and shoulders above uh, the Bucks, I think, in that, uh, that question. All right. So now we'll flip back to the Armchair Football League. Um, we go Panic or Calm, the 0 2 teams edition. We have about seven teams that are 0 2. We got the Texans, the Saints, the Bears, the Commanders, the Jets, the Bengals, and the Cardinals. So you 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 can start it off. You can lead it. Yep. Take it away. We're playing, we're playing a bit of a game show here in the middle. <laughs> um, so we'll start uh, with the Texans. Panic or calm? So I'm going to say calm. Uh, I, I don't think that they really – they hoped for more success this year, but I don't think that they expected it. So I think that they're fine with being 0-2 here at the start. Um I, th- I think that they, if they pick it up, they're happy. If they don't, then they're excited about the potential of what the draft could bring them. Yep, I agree. Um, on a more like micro scale, they lost the three against the Colts, kind of came back at the end. Um, but they've been really good in the turnover battle. Like as something that can, they can look forward to, like if they can keep that up, that's going to start translating some wins. But the problem is they are not moving the ball well or stopping their teams from moving it. The turnover battle is kind of keeping them in this games right now. Um, And I expect their offense to kind of sit closer to the 20 to 22 range rather than the 30th or so. So I think that's some optimism for them, that they're going to kind of swing up a little bit and uh, have some big weeks, especially with Garrett Wilson and uh, Granny Cooks. They haven't quite got them going yet. Yeah, they do have a little bit of a tough few weeks coming up. Um, I don't think Chicago is really easy, but we'll we'll get to them in a little bit um, in this segment. Then they got the Chargers, the Jaguars, the Raiders, the Titans, and the Eagles. So – I mean, it could it could go really south, but if they win a couple of those games in there, they're really excited about what their team is capable of at this uh, point in time. Yeah, I think they've got some optimism they can look forward to. Yeah. Um, even if they do end up losing these games, they're not necessarily like, golly, we've just lost the team who we expected to win zero. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and moving on to maybe the team we thought was going to win zero, uh, here's the Saints. Panic or calm? I think that they're... It's it's difficult knowing because they they, they want to rebuild. So I they don't own their draft pick. So I think at 0 2, you should be panicked a little bit. Like teams should not be okay with their draft pick being a high pick for another team. Like that's not something that you should be okay with because you could have had that pick. So unless what you're getting back makes it worth it, you should be panicked about that. And I, I think that the Saints being 0-2 is just – it's a really bad look for them. Yeah, I agree. I think that they they should be panicked, but not, like, excessively so because they did play really well against the Bucs. It's really the best outcome you could have expected from them against the Bucs. So, I don't know if panic is necessarily the right word, but I'm definitely on the edge of my seat. I'm a little uneasy, um, especially as bad as they lost to the Falcons. Like, if they had shown up like this against the Falcons, they would have won that game. Yeah. Um, So, it's just really tough to see them go that. But their, their defense is fine. Like, weirdly enough, their defense is fine. Their offense is 31st in the league. Like, yeah. that's the problem. Their offense just isn't working right now. So they got to find something to make that work. Which is weird because if you went into this season, you would have expected the opposite because, I mean, the argument for their team still having a chance is you have Jimmy, Kamara, and Chase. Like, that offense can do damage in the game, um, which is why I was never really, like, totally worried about them. Um, it's like if they start trading any of those, any of those guys, then it just becomes, like, really really bad um but I, with them having those guys i think that it's okay um so i think that they just need to get back on track with the offense I, i'm very surprised that the defense is what's keeping them um hopeful uh, as opposed to the offense so i, I think you're just kind of waiting and hoping that that offense comes around and starts to get them into a more uh acceptable uh, situation record wise yeah, if the offense starts to swing back, some of these games that they had that look tough are going to look much more winnable. I mean, yeah. like, if it swings back against the Seahawks or the <clears> Panthers <throat> or something, like, you're talking about a team that could be a playoff team getting blown out because the offense finally woke up. Like, yeah. 
So it, it could happen one of these weeks for them. Uh, then moving on to the team playing the Texans, the Bears. So the Bears, I can't tell. Like, they traded for Cousins. They, it's been really weird. Like, they wanted a, a, a bridge QB, so they traded for Cousins. But they had Davis Mills, and then they trade Davis Mills. So it's I think that you're – they're they're right on the cusp. I, they're a tough one to call. I think that they're calm, but starting to maybe sweat a little bit. Um, what do you think? I think that they're perfectly okay with where they are. I think that they are. They've been in these games. They've lost by a score both times, a touchdown, but a score to the Niners and the Packers. They move the ball really well. They are the 13th best offense. And that's like the worst, like yards is what they're worst at. They actually have been better in other stuff, like 13th best offense overall. And their defense has just been really bad. And that's been ravaged by injuries. So I think they like where they're sitting overall. I think the offense has played as about as well as you'd expect it to. 13th best is certainly above what I think you'd have predicted them to. It's just the defense has kind of, you know, gone off the rails a bit. And I think they're okay with losing games. They have their first, you yeah. know, they look competitive. You know, they gave the Packers a scare. Um, like, if they end up losing 12, 13 games, like I don't think that they're like, this is a lost season. Cause I think that's also part of the reason they traded Mills. Cause I don't think that they see him as that guy. They'd rather yeah. be in our last segment talking about those guys. That's what I, that's, that's kind of my issue with where they're at right now though, is like you trade Mills. If the season has gone South on you and you're going to be in a position to take a quarterback this year, because I think as it stands right now, they're not going to keep cousins and they don't have mills. So you're going to go into the draft next year, pretty like fairly desperate for a, an answer at the quarterback position. And if you end up swinging this season around and maybe flirting with the wild card, I just think you're going to be out of that, that QB picture really personally with how I view this quarterback class. And I just think that that's a difficult situation to kind of weasel your way out of, um, which is why I just wouldn't have traded Mills at this point. Like you trade Mills at the trade deadline if you a one win or two win team, and it looks like you're going to have a top pick where you could feasibly trade up um, for for Shroud or Bryce Young. But like they also aren't in a position roster wise to necessarily turn this thing around quickly. I don't think there's anything lost for them to say we weren't good enough to get the top two guys <laughs> this year. We'll maybe re- in the rest of this class sucks. We'll see how things look next year and like they can kind of keep accumulating assets, like maybe what the Bears should have done in real life um, when the roster fell apart, instead of just throwing a quarterback to the wolves. Like they're in a position where if they get the guy, they can have the guy or they can, you know, kind of buy their time. They've shown patience at quarterback. I mean, they've, they've went for two stopgap guys, but like they went with cousins just because he was basically given to them. Like I think they're showing that they're willing to wait on this thing. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily be too worried about their long-term outlook either, um, even if they aren't as bad as they maybe could be. Yeah, it's not necessarily that I think that they should be worried. It's more just like you have Davis, you had Davis Mills, who if you find yourself out of the quarterback chase in this draft, you at least know that you have somebody that you can throw back there who can keep you competitive and is cheap. You know what I mean? Like now you have to search for one. And I just think that that's that might be where you get into trouble. I mean, it might work out for them. Like maybe they don't want to be good the next year, especially if they don't find a quarterback this year. So it's not like you're ruined by trading mills. It's just like you had a cheap, stable quarterback option and they got a good haul for him. So it's like, I don't know. I, I to me my, personally, I just keep Davis mills around because then I know I, I at least have somebody back there who also has potential to work out, you know? Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. I think I would have kept him too, but like, the backup quarterback market, the way it is, yeah. like these 70 overall quarterbacks are going for the minimum. Like yeah. anything below yeah. a starter you like is going for the minimum. So, like, they're going to be able to get a Davis Mills level quarterback, at least at his current <laughs> level, for nothing next year, too. Or, yeah. like, even if they pay him five million, like, their cap doesn't necessarily matter. They're going to be fine cap wise. So, like, even if they have to overpay for a, just a terrible guy who's going to be fine, like, they're going to have a good enough quarterback if they want it. Um, but they're, if they're not getting a quarterback next this year, they're definitely going to want one next year. So they're trading back, trying to get some picks next year, and that's yeah. year because they're going to start getting that roster built up. Yeah, they're definitely not ruined by trading Mills. It's just like a personal preference that I just think it, it, he's, he, he has a lot of value just by keeping it. That's all. Yeah. 
Um, let's move on to the Commanders, the team that some people liked, some people didn't, some people were in the middle. They're a weird team, yeah. um, but Commanders sitting at zero and two. I think that they're panicked. I think that they they fully expected, or at least starting to panic. Um, I think they're a team that fully expected to be in the race for the NFC East, uh, especially with kind of how weak it looks. Um, and they have some talent on their team. I, it's, I'm not really sure why they aren't um, producing that much. They have a fairly solid roster. They probably need a little bit more receiver depth and whatnot, but like their next two weeks are uh, Philadelphia and Dallas. So the two strongest teams arguably in the NFC East. And if you lose those two games, season's done. Like, like you have to hope for some, some luck to get back into the wild card race, but like you're not winning the NFC East at that point. Yeah, I think they're panicked, but like it's because not necessarily because of the record. Like I think that you can overcome 0 and 2 in the which was gonna be a topic, but yeah, it's the ACFL. You can come back from 0 and 2. But I think it's just because the Cowboys look legit. Like yeah. that was kind of their thought. It's like, oh well, the Cowboys are gonna suck this year and the Eagles aren't quite ready. So this is our year. Yeah. But like the Eagles are only going to be getting better after this year. So to not jump out into winnable <laughs> games in the Jags and Lions, like not necessarily like easy wins, but like you can win those. And if you're gonna be a playoff team, you're going to need to. Um, to come out and kind of lay an egg in both of those. Yeah. Um, and their offense, like, so I was trying to look for positives for these teams, right? The Bears, they're really good on offense. The Saints are pretty decent on defense. But I really couldn't find one for the Commanders. Like, they're kind of like, their defense, their offense has been, like, okay. Yeah. But there isn't positives, and Lance hasn't been good. Like, so, like, it's weird that their offense ranks as good as it does because Lance has been so bad and they haven't yeah. scored. Um, but the defense has been very bad. Yeah. Like, it's not necessarily the Cowboys level. But they don't have the Cowboys offense. Yeah. So it's like, you know, 28th, 27th right now. It's not looking good uh, so for them underneath the surface. That's the other reason why I think panic plays a little bit into this is the Trey Lance injury in real life. If he's not playing well in the sim, he's not going to keep going up in overall. And he's not playing this year in real life. So unless he wins a major award in our league, he's going to be subject to the formula and the formula could drop him down pretty substantially from where he is. And that just hinders your chance for next season as well. They also, I was looking at their roster last night. They're an interesting team to me come trade deadline. Brandon Scherf is 30 years old. He's mm. signed, to, he signed to a four-year deal. You could get something out of him at the trade deadline and kind of rebuild a little bit. Like, except that your window right now is you know very it's cracked and you could just accept like all right we want to open that a little bit more for the future and move somebody like Sherp or Dante Hightower who I think he's only signed on a one-year deal those are two guys you can do like a very trade deadline sort of guy to me yeah if things went south he was a very trade deadline guy yeah, Hightower especially more than than Scherf, just because Scherf is signed for for so long. Uh, he's got three more years after this year, but yeah. Hightower is a guy like you can kind of you know replenish some of the draft assets that you lost in the last two years from trading up for Lance and build around Trey Lance, especially if you still believe in him and think he's going to develop uh, in his in real life third year. So yeah, I think and they're, they're looking at a team that's like going to have to start building for a second contract quarterback yeah. rather than because like they I think they've kind of started to miss that window. Yeah. Um, just because of how good the Eagles I think are going to be, and the Cowboys still being that team, like they're like okay, well, your three and four is looking a little iffy. Four is you know you have a chance on four because you can kind of go all in and like really put up some like good talent around him, but that's like the start of it. It's year four and then the fifth year option. Not to mention that like the Giants aren't they don't really have that bad of a roster and they are loaded with draft. They have three firsts, three seconds this year, and mm -hmm. they're gonna have a ton of cap space. So they could get into that NFC East mix in in one offseason. Yeah, it's definitely a precarious situation for the commanders. And it does look like if, if I'm panicked on anybody on this team, if I'm Trey Lance, I'm panicked. Yeah. Because this was like my chance to become the franchise quarterback was we have great rookies contract yeah. and then it would give me a huge extension, but it's not looking like that's going to look likely. And their eyes are going to start wandering to the quarterbacks that they're going to be able to draft. Yeah. Like I, I'd be worried about him. Like if I were him, like yeah. about how things are looking just because it doesn't make sense to pay a guy, you know, 30 plus million dollars or whatever, if you're going to be bad. 
Yeah. And, you know, yeah, I 100% agree. If they're at the top of the draft this year, he's got to be looking at it being like, do they do they sell the farm just because they want a quarterback for, you know, Stroud or Young? Yeah. So. But moving on, we're, we're to the Jets. How, how are we feeling about the Jets? I, it depends on our week three performance, I would say. Um, if we lose – because we I think we had a solid week against the Browns. I mean, for the most part, I think this, our, our running game was really bad. Um, but for the most part, we got solid production again out of most of our team. Um, so I think that if we have a solid week and we're competitive against the Bengals, I think that we're saying like, hey, we were competitive against two teams in the in the top division in the armchair sports universe, at least the uh, ACFL. If we lose to the Bengals, you start looking at that Browns performance as an outlier uh, performance and you start looking at the Ravens and the Bengals performance as like, OK, we're not even close to the top of this this league but if we're competitive i think that we're saying like all right we could we could could maybe turn this thing around Owen four is a a rough start because i don't think we're going to beat the steelers um but you know you can make an outside shot at the wild card and at the very least you're saying like we got some good pieces i think the in real life performances of a lot of our rookies um kind of quells a lot of panic because they haven't been like totally outstanding but they have been pretty close to that i mean they had really good week one there was maybe a slight drop off from some uh here in week two but nothing substantial so i think that you will it really depends on what how we do in week three and how we perform it against the Bengals. i think yeah i've got i've got some hopium for you here i have uh i came prepared you know you gave very political you know i'm not panicked for calm but <laughs> you are like middle third offense and defense yards oh. wise. you're sitting right in the middle of the pack for that which would indicate you're better than your record obviously you'd say yeah um problem is turnovers yeah kind of knew that from week one but your turnovers have been those flip you're talking about maybe two and oh even um <laughs> you're putting up stats on that level and i put you and the Bengals together on purpose maybe not necessarily in the order of you know expectations or whatever yeah. because the Bengals. On the flip side, I'm going like, to kind of skip your answer on this because they are not looking good at all in anything. Yeah. They are 20th in scoring on both sides, but they're much worse moving the ball at all. Yeah. Uh, so you could argue that they are very lucky, lucky to have scored as many points as they have, which they have not scored very many points. Yeah. Uh, so kind of on the flip side of that, the Bengals are kind of looking like the opposite of you where they've maybe performed better than – uh, they look and their defense has maybe been better than it looks too just yeah. because they have all less points and just to we'll put a, a closing statement on, on my thoughts for the Jets is like this is the pressure this week is all on the Bengals if we lose we're still the underdog team that didn't beat the AFC North if they lose they're a possible Super Bowl contender I don't think they like a real contender but like they at least had a, a solid chance at it um they're starting 0 and three and that's just and then like you said they haven't been performing well so the pressure on them to win this week it's just it's it's all on their side of the field which could get them into trouble it could be the thing that motivates them to just figure this thing out but if they lose they're they're really behind the eight ball and it's kind of like we thought it's kind of like the nfc uh west you know we thought that the afc north was going to be a four-team race where all these teams were going to be really tight if the Bengals start 0-3, you kind of start wondering, like, how long are they going to be even in this fight? Yeah. Their schedule doesn't line up quite as horribly as the Cardinals does yeah. because you do have the Jets this week. But if you lose that one, the Dolphins aren't necessarily unbeatable yeah. on Thursday. So a short week, anything can kind of happen. Then they, but they have to go to Baltimore for that week five. And they could be looking at a very bad record come week five. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they do have a chance to kind of swing that back up with Saints, Falcons, Browns. So, like, they're going to have some open doors throughout the season where they can kind of start turning around. But the longer you wait, the better they're going to have to be. Yeah. They, they got to win these next two games. They got to beat the jets and they got to beat Miami because they're more than likely not going to beat the Ravens. So like, but if you can get to week five and you're two and three, especially with, you know, the, the saints, the, the Falcons and the uh, Browns coming up and even the Panthers a little bit, you know, like you said, you have, you have a, if you're two and three, you have a very easy opportunity to flip that around. If you start 0-3 or 0-4 uh, going into that Ravens game, there's a good chance that you're 0-5 or 1-4. and 
then you're just using those next couple of weeks just to try to fight for a wild card spot. And that's, it's an uphill battle at that point. Well, that and the morale thing too. Like if you yeah. start going on three on four, like you're, you're, it's going to be harder to put down the shovel. Yeah. Like it is just how the Madden momentum always works. Like <laughs> games, when you've lost two in a row games against the jets start to look a little more sketchy, even if the jets are struggling, like yeah. you lose three in a row, the dolphins start to look like quite an intimidating opponent. Yeah. These four in a row and the Ravens look like Packers. Like, yeah. so that's, it's going to build on them if they can't. So start hedging this a little bit. Yeah. Last team, the arguably most surprising, because at least the Bengals had just like teams that are like, okay, the Cowboys are expected to win a division. Steelers are a top team. <laughs> yeah. But the Cardinals, man. I mean, this I'll is ask just, you how you feel, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> this is just an easy answer. It's they're they're panicked. They, they, if they're the only team in the league that is panicked or calm, they're panicked. Um, you get the Rams this week, and that could be easily be an zero and three start. You got the Cardinals on the road next week. That could easily not, not easily, but that that's your real chance for a win to turn this thing around. Because if you can, if you lose to the Rams, you're zero and three, but you lost to some solid teams. Um, if you lose to the the Panthers and then the Eagles and your own five, kind of exactly what we were just talking about with the Bengals, your your season's pretty much done at that point. It doesn't even matter that you got DeAndre Hopkins back. You're zero and five. It's just done. And like, if they can beat the Rams, it's a huge tide turner it's for their whole season, for that division, everything. So this is a huge game for them this week. Yeah, I agree. This is – they got to put all their chips on the table here. Yeah. They got to figure out the offense now. And if the Rams repeat what they did against the Falcons to Kyler Murray, I, I, the season may not be salvageable for him. Yeah. Like, he's been so bad that, like, if he puts up a three-interception performance and can't move the ball at all like Matt Ryan did – or it was four. But, like, if he puts up multiple interceptions and is completely abysmal, like, I can't imagine his morale is above 20. Yeah. I can't imagine anybody on the offense feels any good. Like it's over. Like at that point, like it's going to take a lot to start overcoming <laughs> that. Um, the, the other reason why I think they're panicked too is like they've performed so badly in these first two weeks that look, I get it. Losing Landry and losing Hopkins are huge pieces to lose on your team. But if you were considering yourself a like a, a contender for the Super Bowl or a team that really should be in that mix. Your team can't swing that badly by losing one guy on each side of the ball. It, it, granted, it's your best player, so you could expect some of a drop off. But to drop off so poorly, I mean, that just that's a statement on the rest of your team. And I think that's why you need a, a big week against a big team to get that thought out of people's heads. Yeah, their defense has been good for some positive for them. Yeah. Um, a lot of that is just because like the games have been lower scoring, uh, especially against the Raiders, but they held up admirably well considering how much of an onslaught they got because of how bad the offense was to yeah. only allow field goals all game. It's pretty impressive for them. Yeah. Um, and really this game was a couple of longer, lower odds field goals away from being like, it's still one score. Yeah. You know, like the Kyler injury, I took a lot more wind out of the sales, but like it could have been nine. Yeah. In the fourth, and it's like, well, I mean, that's possible. <laughs> 15 felt insurmountable, but yeah. like nine wasn't, even though they're both still technically two scores. Um, but so, I mean, they're in the middle for scoring, yeah. ranked top 10 in the yards and stuff like that. You know, a lot of it's short field stuff, um, but they're holding up as well as you could expect. But yeah. um, it's kind of, it's similar to like the Cowboys defense in the opposite, right? It's just like, I don't think that they're going to be that bad, or I don't think they're going to be that good. Um, they're going to need the offense to start playing better. Yeah. The other reason <laughs> that I think the, 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 the best thing that I think that this shows the rest of the league and the armchair sports universe to me is this. I would, I want to see teams, a, a number of teams be a little bit more conservative with their cap and their draft assets. The Cardinals haven't really been necessarily bad in that sense, but your season can turn on a dime very quickly. You know what I mean? And like yeah. the sim could just give you the low end and that's fine. Like it happens. And like the Cardinals right now are slated to have minus $50 million in cap space 
uh, next season. They don't really have a ton to roll over. They're pretty much in the situation, or at least close to the situation that the Saint, the in real life Saints were in, with their cap, which is just cap hell. And you're just going to be kicking the can down the road, putting yourself in a deeper and deeper hole as this thing goes on. And what do you have to show for it? You know, they were what eight and nine last year, I think. They were. They probably were nine and eight, or maybe. Oh, no, they, they, they were, they, so they were 10 and seven. They were tied for the NFC West lead. And I think that they lost in the first round of the playoffs. To the Seahawks. Seahawks. Yeah. So if this season goes south on them, you're in cap hell for at least the next two years with one playoff visit, your own one of the playoffs and possibly giving away a top pick to another team in a very questionable trade. So, like, just I, I implore a lot of these teams, like, in, unless you're really close to a Super Bowl, be conservative with your assets. Protect your future. Because being in Capel is not fun. Like, you just spend the offseason just restructuring guys for the most part. And trying to sign minimums or, you know, yeah. they get some skills. But, yeah. I would, so, my advice would be, and this is, this is kind of how I've tried to operate. I think you can be very reckless with one of them i think yeah. that you could survive cap hell if you have picks yes like you can use your picks to kind of get you know maneuver some stuff add guys that they're going to restructure down to the minimum for you if you need to make the move like if you're conservative with your picks you can be aggressive with your cap which is where i've tried to be yeah I have lots of picks but i'm i'm very aggressive with my cap not as aggressive <laughs> as them either, but like i've been aggressive yeah but so that's where i've tried to live but you yeah. can be on the opposite end where um, I think a team like the Chiefs have done a good job being the opposite. They've been aggressive with their picks to get guys, but those guys ended up being very cheap contract wise yeah. and very good. And they have cap freedom. Yeah. They were able to pay Fant a lot of money, which you know, sucks but for yeah. now, but we'll see how that turns out. But like they were able to still have money to keep Tyron Matthew, to keep Tyreek Hill. Yeah. So they were the opposite. They don't have picks necessarily, but they do keep the guys they have. Yeah. To me, it's like you're right. Like if if you're gonna be one, if, if you're gonna do it, you have to be one of them. You can't be both. And it's, I'm not too worried about the Cardinals because they're not like barren of picks. They have they, the only thing that they're missing is a first this year and a third this year. But they have two fourths, two fifths, three sixths. Like and they they've drafted pretty well. So it's like the Cardinals. I'm not concerned about. It's more about like I think that they're a good example because the situation that they're in with their cap and what they potentially could have to show for being in that cap hell should scare some teams off from signing guys to these big contracts that don't really make sense for their team. Like the Panthers, like, yeah, signing Teller gives them a chance to make the playoffs, but like, you know, they're going into next season with minus $38 million in cap space. And like, yeah, they have, then they have a first, a third and a fifth this year. Like that's not a situation you want to be in. You're in cap hell. You don't have a ton of picks and you're not really a contender. Like we're surprised that they're performing so well. Like if you look at their roster, you're, you're like, they're a fringe wildcard team. Maybe, uh, you know, like you don't yeah. feel confident in them. And that's just, I feel like so many teams are in that situation that don't need to be. And it's just going to make a lot of these off seasons for a lot of people very boring. Well, I think so. Kind of circling back on the Cardinals picks, they have a lot of them, but like not having the first for the next two years, I think. Is that what it is? Or is it no, last they, year? It was last year and this year. So they have all of their picks this year. after this year. Okay. Well, that's better than I thought because I yeah. thought it was both years. But like still, like the first is kind of where I was focusing on that. Yeah. Like they have traded a lot of their picks previously. Like they didn't have a lot last year. Yeah. And they're starting to not have as many. So maybe they're starting to cool off on the picks trading. Yeah. But like, I still fear that they're going to do something this year. And like, we need one more player and like yeah. that part of it. But like, yeah, if they, if they stay cooled off and they let the picks reset a little bit and they have picks every year, then I think they're going to be fine with that. Yeah. But like still not having the first in a year where they could collapse is a disaster. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. And that's, so and like, that's the part yeah. that the first is like the thing. It's like, you got to hold on to those more. Yeah. And they, than they did with their cap situation. If they collapse in a year, but they had 20 million in cap space to start the year, I feel differently Yeah, because they don't have a first, but they've got money so they can 
fix things without the first that they gave up. Which is, but they, why, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's what I, I was just finishing up. Well, that's, and that's why I think in the NFL, you see guy, like talented guys go for, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth round picks instead of first, seconds, and thirds, because you, if you're not close or if you don't feel like this move is really going to get you more into the mix, you don't do it. You know what I mean? And like a team at least wants to get an asset out of a guy who's not keeping them close. Yep. So and there's I, less of a, like almost like a holding on to the valuation of them. Like yeah. in the in real life, like if I have Shaq Mason's bad example, cause they should have kept him. But if I have Shaq Mason, who I feel like is going to become redundant or isn't going to help get me over the hump at all. I'm not going to hold to, he is the best guard in the league. He's worth the second rounder. Like we do here. Yeah. Like he, we're not going to hold to that in the same way. We're not going to get it either. Like, they can't hold on to it because they just keep him. Like, yeah. you know, here we understand the valuation we're willing to give it. So I think it balances out a little bit, but like to an extent, yeah. Like, you have to recognize your situation you're in and also have to recognize what the team is in. Like, I could go and offer a fair value for Sheriff right now. Yeah. And that would be taken. Cause like, shit, I mean, you're going to offer me a first for a guard who's that good and yeah. has been that for a while and has been under contract for three years. But like, would that make any sense for me to do a guard's probably not going to put me in any different situation, like substantially, like he's yeah. not going to make me like a favorite, like over the package or nothing. Like, yeah. But he's a player that I would necessarily be looking at because guard is a weakness for me. I would yeah. be looking at him, but not for the first that he would cost if I was going to make them make the move. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, that I think people need to get in their heads is like most positions most some some are different but with most positions uh, you're gonna get fairly similar production out of a 77 overall player as you would out of an 82 overall player but there seems to be a huge gap of like that 77 overall player is a scrub he's worth like a sixth round pick as opposed to that 82 overall player is like oh they could do something i'll give you a second rounder and it's like you gotta you gotta be more conservative with that approach some positions are different some positions there is a 77 to an 82 is a pretty drastic jump but especially for like the premium positions like i've done sims where drake london goes off i've done sims where deshaun jackson goes off as a wide receiver like yeah getting an overall player a higher overall player increases your odds of reaching the high end but how much you know what i mean some positions it doesn't get you that hot that 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 much further to your high end yeah, it just matters exactly how they're going to be playing in your system, in your scheme. Like Saquon yeah. Barkley, better running back than Ronald Jones. But right now, Saquon Barkley isn't playing well. Yeah. yeah they can't get him to run the ball at all. Yeah. So does it matter if it was Ronald Jones back there running for two yards carry? No. Exactly. But, so it's, it, they're going to have to figure out Saquon. They're going yeah. to get him going. The ability is going to help. But like, <laughs> it's, it's all about what's going to matter and how much that mattering is going to impact your winning. Yeah. Um, and we'll just close it off here. The, this will be our final segment just to kind of preview the uh, draft a little bit. CJ Stroud and Bryce Young. These are the two quarterbacks, uh, this, dra- this draft class. Will Levis was there, but I mean, when I watch him, I'm just not impressed at all, especially given his age. If he was younger, I'd be like, oh, he's got some, he's got some room here. But he's like 20, he's going to be 24 as a rookie. And he's just he's so got, He's got some Malik Willisness to him in a sense. Yeah. Where like if he was 21, they'd be like, well, he's the guy. But it's just, you don't know. Yeah. See, and he's, cool. he's, he'll be 24 as a rookie. And he spent his entire career at big power. Con- like he's, was, he played at Penn State where he couldn't upstage their current quarterback, who's nothing special. And then he goes to Kentucky. So he's in the SEC. Nice. So like he's around professional facilities and not progressing. So I, I think he's, I, to me, he's out of the race right now. He could find himself back in maybe, but I don't, I'm not confident in that. So it's Stroud and Bryce Young right now. And I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm softening on Bryce Young a little bit. I don't know how you feel. So I'm concerned about like the general aggression of the offense around him. Um, I think there's been some losses, but like, yeah, I think that if you were a team Stroud guy coming into the year, you're feeling much better about your team Stroud than a team young guy coming in. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um, Young's yards per attempt's going down. Um, his pass rating's down a bit. Like, 
and he hasn't necessarily played like this toughest schedule you can imagine. It's not like yeah. he's playing the top teams in the conference. On the flip side, Stroud is even better statistically than he was last year in looking the part. Like, yeah. I think Bryce Young still looks really good, but what the question I was going to pose is, is it now becoming a one quarterback race? Kind of similar to the <laughs> Burrow Tua draft where it came very quickly. It was Burrow. Yeah. And then Tua and Herbert. You know, obviously it's worked out differently, but like coming into the draft, but is it becoming more like that where it's one and then two, or is it going to kind of shake out to a one, a one B sort of thing? I personally think we're closer to the Burrow Tua class than we are to the Winston Mariota class because like there's the, like, I'll watch. I, I started to dig into these guys and mostly I've been watching 2021 20, tape on them there's times where I watch Stroud and I'm like, he missed that read. But if, if he can get that, he's a star. Like it's, it's phenomenal. And more often than not, he hits it. There's just a couple of times that I look at it and I'm like, Oh man, it was right there for you. You just hesitated a little bit. I haven't really started. I haven't seen too, too much of his 2022 tape and I'm hoping that that will change. But when I look at him, I'm like, that's a guy who probably should sit for the first six weeks, get comfortable you know, I'm, I'm very big on that. I'm a very big proponent of, of rookie QBs sitting for the first couple of weeks, unless Mac Jones, I didn't think should. I, th- I thought he was ready to just step in and command an offense. But that doesn't mean like I thought he was, you know, I, I was very high on Mac Jones. But like there's a difference between being able to start week one and being a better prospect. Like Stroud to me might be a better prospect. He probably is a better prospect. But I think he just needs that little bit of a time to just get acclimated to the NFL and the, the standards and the routine and stuff. But like, that's a guy who like sits for the first couple of weeks and is a star. Young though, the excuse I can make for him is the talent I think is not quite as good at Alabama this year. Um, I don't think that the receivers are quite as good, but that's also concerning too though. Like Alabama, the, the knock on those quarterbacks has always been all oh, they're surrounded by talent. They're surrounded by talent. Look what they do with it. Okay, but like, you gotta be able to do something with he's still playing with talented players it's not like he's playing with garbage and the fact that he looks a little shaky just concerns me i'm like what is he going to look like when we get into these bigger contests yeah the sec games are going to be huge for him as he starts to get in these slugfests in the sec is he going to be able to still kind of if he looks the same as he did against like texas and stuff as i was watching if he looks the same that against georgia then i'm starting to think like okay maybe he didn't kill texas but like yeah, Georgia's are a bunch of killers over there, and he yeah. still held that held his own with then you would consider subpar talent compared to his opponent. Yeah, and you can start to see him maybe elevating the offense more than it appeared early, right? Yeah. But if he's if he plays proportional <laughs> to that against Georgia, they're gonna get killed. A and B, it's gonna look like the same as he is now. And you're starting to think maybe maybe he is more of a scheme dependent sort or offense dependent sort of quarterback right now. Yeah. And he's got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, either way, it's going to be an exciting race. I hope that we get a chance to, to see these two face off against each other, just because, you know, watching Lawrence go up against um, fields, that was just so much fun just to watch those two guys duke it out. But yeah. it's going to be a fun conversation throughout the rest of the season. I do think that it's just going to be between Stroud and Young though. Yeah, I think we are in two quarterback race right now. Those guys, I'm excited about a lot of them, just to see what they can do and see yeah. if they can get there. Levis was one guy. I was like, God, I hope he can stay on. But it just – it kind of turned out to be – the easy answer ended up seeming like the correct answer. You yeah. wanted it to be all these different guys up near the top, but the straightforward answer has seemed to prevail so far. Yeah. So that'll do it for the week two recap of the Armchair Sports Universe. Thank you for joining me, Steelbacker. No problem. And we will see you next week. We'll try to get it figured out um, on the production side of things to try to bring this to you live. Uh, we, I think we'll probably get to some mailbag questions uh, next week. And we'll get those uh, going. So thanks for joining us. Uh, keep tuning into our YouTube channel, and uh, we'll see you next week. See ya.